Hello. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. We're happy to be with you tonight, and uh, we're happy that you are with us uh, tonight. And we are going to praise the Lord. And before we do that, we're going to go into just a little bit um, a prayer. Father, we are happy once again to be with you and together, gathered together uh, this evening with you tonight. And uh, we ask you to be present with us. May you receive what uh, our hearts have to give you uh, our praise, our thankfulness, and um, open our hearts and our ears to be able to receive what you want to, te to, to tell us this evening. And may this evening be a blessing for both you and us. Thank you, Father. Amen. We are your church. We pray for gifts.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'll be giving the announcements from the back of the church uh, this evening. And I just wanted to uh, just encourage you. We need to pray, God, build your kingdom here. That's the reason why we've been singing this song for the last two months to start off uh, every evening service. And before that, we were doing it in the, uh, uh, in, on Sunday morning as well. And the part of the reason is that I want this song to get anchored in our souls. Build your kingdom here, Lord. First, build it in my heart. Lord, build it in the heart of your people. Build it in the heart of this community. Build it in our state. And Father, build it in our nation and build it around the world. We want to see the kingdom of God advance. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements here before we continue with worship. Uh, we have the tithes and offering here. Uh, just want to uh, let you know about the three ways that you can give your tithes. And offerings, actually, there's four ways you can come on Sunday morning and give it uh, during our uh, in-person outdoor worship service uh, in the uh, playground uh, yard. The second way is to give online at chowfirst.com backslash give, or you can drop it off at the church Monday uh, through Thursday between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., or you can send it by mail to our church P.O. Box 24, uh, 248. Uh, a couple announcements here. I just want to let you know that uh, the Humboldt property renovation is underway. Uh, we're working hard to progress with this, and we still have about $2,500 that we need to raise, and I would like to encourage you to prayerfully consider, if you haven't already participated, uh, to pray and ask the Lord for how you can participate in this project as we're getting this uh, house ready that was given to the church over a year ago, getting it ready for service for the Lord. Uh, Wednesday morning, we have the women's prayer group uh, in the playground uh, at 9 a.m., we want to encourage all the women who can come to come and, and uh, for this time of fellowship, prayer, and just seeking God together. And uh, it's uh, definitely a time of encouragement, and I want to encourage you to come if you're able to. Wednesday evening at 6 a.m., we have our Royal Rangers and Impact Girls Clubs that, Club that is meeting. Uh, so the, what I call this is an in-person outdoor meeting. And... Uh, I have the, my announcement here is a little bit outdated, forgive me for that, but um, what we have going here is, uh, it's meeting with the boys in the Humboldt property, the girls in the playground lawn, and uh, we've had a great group that showed up this last week. If you have children or grandchildren that would like to be a part of this or would like to get out of the house, uh, I want to encourage you to invite them to come. The next thing here is Wednesday night, we have our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're studying the book of Romans, and we're going to look at chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, and want to encourage you to uh, tune in at 6.30 uh, p.m. on Wednesday. I just wanted to let you know that every Sunday morning and every uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday morning for Sunday school and Sunday morning for, for worship service, we have our adult Sunday school class, our young adult Sunday school class that's going on, and then we have our our outdoor worship, and I want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. We had a wonderful time this morning, and uh, we had a chance to hear Pastor Mikael share God's Word, encouraged us and exhorted us, as well as worshiping the Lord and praising Him. Next Sunday, don't forget, it is Communion Sunday. We want to encourage you to uh, be sure that you're prepared to go. 
Uh, if you're with us, we'll provide the communion elements. If you're not and you're following us online, we want to ask you to prepare and be ready so that when we share communion next Sunday, uh, you can participate with us. So that's all the announcements that I have right now, and I'm going to turn it back over to, to, to the worship team and let them continue to lead us to the Lord in prayer. There's a passage in Scripture that was just rolling over in my mind. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let's look at what the Lord has done and rejoice in that tonight. several things. First of all, as you know, I've been blind all my life. Oxygen damaged my eyes. But I still thank God that we have a freedom to be in our country to do what we want to do. For a lot of you who don't know, in history, if I was born during Hitler's time, uh, Myself and others uh, could have been told that we're going to a special tool, a special school, and that we're uh, instead we'd be uh, killed off. So that is the main thing I am very thankful uh, for. I think about Johnny Erickson Tata, who would give anything to be able to sit upright and to be able to. Uh, um, to feed, to feed herself uh, regularly. And so many things we just take that we don't uh, thank God for. I also thank God for the fact of my house may not be fancy, but each time when I hear about people losing their homes and can't rebuild, I just start thanking God for what we do have. I thank God for the sermon that was uh, preached this morning, talking about ministries, whatever God has you to do. I think about the uh, 
David all he had. He had nothing in him, and yet he had a um, slings, a, a sling and rocks to throw, you know, at the Philistines. You know, God let him use uh, what he had. And the most important lesson on that is I thank God for the fact that uh, when David tried on Saul's armor and it was heavy for him. And the lesson in that is uh, don't try on anybody else's ministry that you would covet. So even if it's even from the widow's might or from giving a, a glass of water, you know, um, don't put expectations on yourself to do great things or, or pressure yourself. So I thank God for uh, Mikkel's uh, message. So that's what I have to say. Actually, giving a glass of cold water in his name is a great thing, according to the scriptures, right? Right. Yes. Right. It is. I stand corrected. <laughs> no, uh, I'm saying no, some people no. would say people that's not much. Think, no, yeah. people may think that's not much, but right. it really is. Even that's from right. being on the telephone to uh, praying with people, why we still have the freedom to do that. And the reason why it is so incredible is because Jesus says, "When you do it, you do it it as unto me." Hmm. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord, and we praise you because you're worthy of our praise and our honor and our glory. We thank you so much for what you do for us. May you be lifted up and may you be praised and magnified, oh God, you who are our strength and our redeemer. We thank you so much because you deliver us and you set us free. You're our healer. You're our, our rock, our foundation. It's going to be pretty extensive and intrusive, Father God in order to overcome this cancer that he has been battling against. Father God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, that when this is done, he would be completely and totally restored and healed. God, do your work in his life. Touch his wife, Esther, Father God, as she's walking beside him through this process. God, manifest yourself on his behalf. Lord, I pray for Barbara as well, this woman that we've been praying for, the cousin of Sister Juanita. And I ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would work and move in a very real and very powerful way in that situation. Thank you for the work that you've, and the reports that we've gotten back from her regarding the, the, the shrinking of the size of the cancer and the spots, Lord, as the doctor has been encouraging her. Lord, we're believing you that she'll be completely and totally restored and healed. In Jesus' name. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and move also Father God, in the life of our friends, Father God, Sathena Murphy, who served this church for a number of years, be with her, strengthen her, build her up. <clears throat> Father God, I pray that you would be also with Brother Rick's uncle, Pastor Allen, that you would touch him and restore him to health, Father God, as he's been battling against COVID-19. God, for Tammy Baker, that your Holy Spirit would touch our, our dear sister, Father God, and strengthen her, her legs, her knees, oh God, and help her in Jesus' name. Father God, to regain her health in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray likewise that you would work and move in her neighbor's life, Maria. God, who's battling with COVID, that your Holy Spirit would touch her and manifest yourself on her behalf. Father God, I pray that you would touch Chris Duncan as he's recovering from the surgery that he had on his shoulder. God, that everything will go well and bless 
bless Gail as she is holding down the fort, as it were, during this time of his recuperation. Give her strength in Jesus' name. Touch her daughter and grandson as well, Erica and Nathan. Lord, they need your grace and mercy in their lives. Father God, I want to conclude with praying for Nicole. Nicole is a, a woman, a mother, a wife. And God, she's been in the hospital for a long time in sort of a semi-comatose state. And God, I just pray that somehow, some way, you would rectify whatever's been disjuncted in her brain. And God, that you would restore her to complete and total health. God, that she would completely and totally wake up and there would be no issue, no problems in her life. I ask this not in my name, but in the mighty name of Jesus, manifest yourself on her behalf. And God, in the, on behalf of her family, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you would do this. Lord, there's a fight going on. It's not a physical fight. Well, in some ways it is, unfortunately. But it's for sure and certain that it is a spiritual fight that's going on in our, for the heart and soul of our nation. And God, it is my prayer that tonight you would work and move in the hearts and souls of men all across this land, and women all across this land, and young people and older people, Father God, all across this land. Lord, we're on the precipice of, of a cliff, Father God. And the only bridge to safety is through your son, Jesus. And God, I pray somehow, some way, you would touch our nation, and God that this would be the unleashing of a spiritual awakening like we've never seen or experienced in the history of our nation. I know it's a bold prayer, Father God, but I know that you love humanity and that you love men and women all across this world. But Father, I'm praying specifically for our nation. And God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would manifest yourself from coast to coast from the north to the south. And God, that there would be a great awakening in this land. Oh God. That there would be a great awakening. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak the name. That's above every name. I speak the name of Jesus into our land. And God, I pray that there would be a mighty move of your spirit. And Father, that we could reclaim our soul and spirit. Your word says that if your people who are called by your name humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek you with all their heart, that you will hear from heaven. And God, I pray that you would work in your church because your word tells us judgment begins in the house of God. That you would work in our hearts, O oh God, and help us to repent before you of our attitudes, of our actions that are not in line with your word. And God, I pray that you would work in our society in general. Those who do not know you, that they would start hungering and thirsting after you. And may your children be such a light and testimony in this world. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' precious name, I ask these things. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of the Lord tonight. And as we move forward in this evening, we're going to go straight to the Word right now as we pursue what God's Word tells us about the subject of youth in Asia. Youth in Asia. Last week we began this study and this week, we are continuing this study, doing part number two. Last week, we looked at several questions. We looked at how did the current youth in Asia movement begin in America? We looked at the question, what does youth in Asia really mean? What are the goals of the youth in Asia movements? In plural, because there are several movements. They've, they've been uh, many, and they have consolidated, and, and there's probably a handful of well-known euthanasia movements that are pushing the euthanasia uh, uh, agenda on Western societies, not just here in America, but also in Europe and elsewhere. 
And then the last question we looked at is, what methods are used when euthanasia is administered and practiced? In summary, euthanasia traditionally means an easy, painless death. That's, that's what the word means in the original language in Greek. However, the term is now used to mean mercy killing, physician-assisted suicide, assisted suicide, involuntary euthanasia, imposed death, and a whole slew of other names. It is the direct killing of a patient by administering lethal drugs or other direct means of ending life or by withholding or withdrawing ordinary means of sustaining life such as food and water, protection from exposure, medications, and so on. Tonight, we're going to answer the following questions. So please hold and bear with me as we move forward in this because it's very important. The first question that we're going to ask is, what is the biblical response to euthanasia? Why is it wrong? Secondly, when should death be declared? When can we know for sure someone has actually died? What are the dangers of a living will and advanced directives? This is something that is very very real and present in our society, especially if, if you've ever gone in for a surgery that is serious, you may have had this presented to you and saying, we need to know what you want in the event that you lose your ability to communicate, and uh, we need to know what you want. And so sometimes we feel forced to, to sign and fill out this information. But we're going to talk about what are the dangers of living wills and advanced directives and then lastly, what can we do to protect ourselves from doctors or individuals that don't have our best interest in mind? That don't have our best interest in mind. And unfortunately, that is something that can happen. I would hate to think that family members would encourage euthanasia. They wouldn't call it that. They would call it mercy or, or you know, whatever it might be. So that they can enjoy their loved one's inheritance. Because if they're still alive, it still belongs to them. And God forbid that that would be the motivation, but folks, we live in a fallen world, a sin-infested uh, world, where people can do things because, well, do things for unjust and unholy reasons. Last week, we said that the main truth of this whole series on euthanasia is all human life is of great value to God from conception to birth, from, or death, from conception to death, from conception to death. All human life is of great value to God. So the first question that we're going to look at tonight is what is the biblical response to euthanasia? Why is it wrong? The first reason is the inherent value of human life. Now, we talked about this when we looked at the question of abortion. And why is abortion wrong? Why isn't it right? What does the Bible tell us about abortion? And we, we talked about this issue that, that, that there is inherent value in human life. The Bible says that we are created in God's image. God has created humanity in His image. That's what sets us apart from other animal life. We are not just animals. We are created in the image of the Creator of the universe. God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in His own image. In the, in the image of God, He created him, male and female. He created them. According to the author Leon Cass, life is in, its, is in itself something holy or sacred, transcendent, set apart like God Himself. Life is something before which we stand or should stand with reverence, awe, and grave respect because it is beyond us and unfathomable. To regard life as sacred means that, we should not, that it should not be violated, opposed, or destroyed, and positively that it should be protected defended, and preserved. I remember as a boy growing up, and I was, uh, we had chapel. I went to a Christian school. My parents sacrificed to send us to a Christian school. And I remember 
uh, we had a chapel service, and this man was wheeled in in a wheelchair. And he was brought up to the stage, and from the middle of his arms, his biceps, there was no, he didn't have any, any further arm. It was just a stub here that was about six inches long on both sides. And the same thing with his thighs. He had nothing beyond the middle part of his thighs. And, and I thought, wow, who is this guy? And believe it or not, earlier, before as class was getting, this, he and his family, wife and children, were pulling into the campus. And I saw him in the driver's seat, driving this vehicle. And obviously at that point in time, I didn't notice that he didn't have any arms or any legs beyond the middle part of the biceps and his thighs. And I, when I saw him there, and as he shared his testimony... And how God is able to use anybody to communicate the message of Jesus Christ. I was overwhelmed. And he talked about a special vehicle being uh, engineered for him so that he could actually drive a vehicle with his two nubs. I know, I know that it, it sounds impossible. But to see him there also with his wife and with his children. You see, in the world today, that man would have possibly been... A, the parents of that man would have possibly been strongly encouraged to let him die. Because the quality of his life, according to mankind, would have been absolutely null or nil. Worthless. But we see what God did with this man in going and testifying to his grace and mercy all over the place as an evangelist preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I remember... David Ringer, a man who had cerebral palsy, as he preached the gospel the first time that our pastor, youth pastor, showed us the video of him at Jerry Falwell's, uh, Jerry Falwell's church in, in Virginia, Liberty Baptist Church. I remember seeing him speak and struggling sometimes to get words out because his speech was handicapped and his body, it was hard for him to move without a severe limp. And this lisp in his voice and how he shared his testimony. My heart was touched by God's grace and mercy. And then he invited his wife to come up and his kids. And his wife was a beautiful woman. You see, if he had been born to parents today, the medical professional may have strongly encouraged them to bring an end to his life because his life would not be one of quality. And yet we see how God used him and has used him to impact the lives of many people. Matter of fact, he had five kids. I tell you, life has value. Human life has value. My heart grieves for countries like Iceland where if a mother who is pregnant has a test and they find that the, the baby has the, the mongoloid or the trisomy. I'm not sure how they say it in, in French. The, the gene that a child is born with mongoloid features. There, the Iceland government says that baby must be destroyed. Abort it. Because we don't want to deal with that in our society. My heart grieves because every one of those children and those who were defending the rights of mongoloid children, you see these men and women who had the features of, Mon of, 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 uh, of being a mongoloid, but their intelligence was sharp, as sharp as our own. Not all. There are those who have deep handicaps, but not all are, the, are in that case or in that situation. And I think, oh God, condemning humanity to death based upon a medical test. Oh, a doctor will say to a woman, your child is handicapped. You should abort it. And the mother says, no, I will take whatever God gives me. The child is born perfectly healthy. You see, doctors don't have the skinny on everything. Even with all their technology and science, Man without God does not value the life that God has created. 
Man without God does not value the life that God has created. Secondly, human life is sacred. And we talked about that a little bit in this quote that I read. God alone is the author of a person's life. And He alone may determine when a person's life will end. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, or 27, it says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. You see, our hand, our lives are in the hands of God. And it is He who gives us breath, and it is He who should take it away. In His time. In His place. Like I said many times before, if I live to be 99 years old, praise God. But if I live another day, and I go to be with Him, praise God. The Apostle Paul said to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And that should be our heart attitude in this whole situation and circumstance. Human life is sacred. We also look at Psalms 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Why? Because they will be reunited with Him. They will be reunited with Him. You see what is being pushed upon our society today is to replace the idea of the sanctity of life with this idea of the quality of life. If a person's life doesn't have a quality to it, then they shouldn't be allowed to live. Or they should be strongly, or those who are responsible for them should be strongly encouraged to put an end to that life because they don't have a certain quality of life. You see, <clears throat> Peter Singer, one of these ethneticians, modern ethneticians, basically said those who should live are those who have value to the society. They are producers. And if they are not able to produce, then their life should not be worthy of living and draining resources on the society. Obviously, Peter Singer is not a believer in God. He doesn't believe in the sanctity of human life. And he's willing to say that we should put people to death who are a burden on society. God, help us. God, help us. Thirdly, because life is sacred to God and He alone is the author of a person's life, He commanded Moses and the people of Israel, thou shalt not murder. That's another reason why euthanasia should not be an option. What this means when it says thou shalt not murder is, is the intentional, premeditated taking of someone's life. The intentional, premeditated taking of someone's life. You may be thinking, Pastor Stephen, listen, euthanasia is different. It is helping to alleviate someone's suffering. And I understand that disease, accidents, there are a lot of things that people can experience and it causes great suffering in their physical body. Those who have rheumatoid arthritis in their joints, not just their hands, but and there are other joints of the body. That's a cause for great suffering. But let me just share this with you. With today's medical technology advancing rapidly, there are many ways that the physical pain of suffering can be alleviated through medical treatment. There's a lot of ways that it can be mitigated or alleviated. What about those in a coma who may not be suffering physically? They're just in a deep sleep, as it were. But there is no guarantee that they'll wake up. What about them? Because they're in a coma, because they're on a bed, obviously their body is functioning. Even if their brain waves are limited, their body is still functioning. At that point in time, we, don't, we can't guarantee that they will, they will wake up. But there are testimonies of people who have waken up from a coma many, many years after they went into a coma. And they recovered sufficiently to live satisfied lives. I remember as a, as a young boy, there was this teenager in our school, a Christian school that we were attending at that time, and she was in the high school, I was in the elementary school, probably a friend of my siblings, my older brother and sister. 
and she was in a vehicle accident, and she was in a coma for nine months. Nine months. The pastor would go weekly, and he was a pastor in a church of 15,000 people. He would go weekly to her hospital, and he would read to her from God's Word, and he would pray for her. He did that weekly. And in that particular situation, after nine months, suddenly one day she opened her eyes, and she was there. But what she shared with the pastor was simply this. I was aware of all that was going on around me, but I couldn't respond. I heard you, Pastor, when you read the Word and when you prayed for me. I was there, but I couldn't respond. I was present. I was there. So God's Word is very clear that human life is of inherent value and it is sacred and it is God alone who decides when a person should go to be with Him or enter into eternity. That leads us to the next question. When should death be declared? When should death be declared? Now, according to the Legislator Medical Policy Manual, we see the following. Now listen, folks, uh, this material is not original with me, obviously. I've looked up some material. I want to encourage you, if you have a pen right now, look, uh, simply write ALL.org. It's called All Life League. Simple. But it's, it, the, the website is www.allall.org. Simply. And you can look up a lot of things on there, not just euthanasia, but a whole slew of other things that talk about this. So I, I have drawn from about almost 90 pages worth of material there that I printed out because I felt it was important enough for me to read it all to be able to condense it and bring it into a place where we could share it in an effective way. So in this document that I have, they have this whole section on the legislator's medical policy manual helping those who are in positions of political power to know how they should respond to issues that deal with the sanctity of life, and particularly in the area of euthanasia. This is what this policy manual says. Death must not be determined or declared unless and until there is no doubt that life on earth for this human being has ended. Death signifies the breakdown of the unity of the organism, the body itself, which unity is served by the inner cooperation of at least three vital systems. Number one, the circulatory system, the heart, and the pumping of the blood. Secondly, the respiratory system, the breathing in of our lungs and the breathing out, and also the entire brain. I say this, the entire brain. Therefore, death cannot and should not be determined or declared unless and until there is destruction of at least these three basic unifying systems. For instance, on destruction is not, is not a concern with the impossibility of a res restoration to function of these systems, meaning that someone has a massive heart attack. All of a sudden, oxygen is not being pumped throughout the body to the brain and, and, and even though there may still be some respiration going on, breathing, the oxygen is not being carried throughout the body as it needs to. And thus, all three systems are directly impacted. And we've heard of people who've had massive heart attacks and dropped dead or died shortly thereafter. It could be <clears throat> someone who has received a brain trauma so terrible and so hard that it shuts down the whole brain, thus shutting down the heart and the respiratory system because there's no further control. Or it could be someone <coughs> who their respiratory system receives a shock. It could be drowning. It could be suffocation. Someone swallows something and all of a sudden the respiratory system shuts down do everything to try to reanimate and get the blockage cleared and all that stuff. But then, ultimately, if it's not cleared and it still goes on, or someone has been in water, because there is no oxygen, even though the heart may be pumping for a while, 
the brain ultimately dies and ceases. So we're talking about traumatic experiences that bring the end of life. Death signifies not only no further functioning in the future, but also the radical incapacity of these systems to function at the present moment. In the arena of donating one's organs, the individual whose organs are removed is still alive. Listen to me. The person whose organs are removed is still alive. They cannot be taken from someone who is already dead. Doctors will often say that the person is brain dead, no sign of brain activity, and thus recommend to the family that their body parts be harvested because there is no hope of recovery. Harvested to do what? To help other people. However, their circulatory and respiratory systems are still functioning. And if the respiratory system and the circulatory system is still functioning, the brain is still functioning because it's the brain that makes those things work. That's the computer that makes operate the rest of our body. There are testimonials of people who have recovered from being brain dead. Brain dead. There's one story of a 22-year-old man who had been in a car accident. The medical personnel declared him brain dead. And thus his family consented to have his organs harvested to help other people in need. While he was being prepared, his foot twitched and he was taken to intensive care where he fully recovered. He was this short of having his body put to death so that his organs could serve other people. I looked up online and found that the average heart transplant costs $1.4 million. $1.4 million. And the average kidney transplant costs approximately $400,000. Organ transplants are expensive. A question I ask myself, is there an ul ul uh, ulterior motive to declaring one brain dead? Is there an uh, ulterior motive to declaring one brain dead. One who may after a short period of time as the body heals and restores itself because we are incredible creatures that God has created in His image to restore and heal itself so that there is a moment in time where the body can reanimate and the brain kicks back in and, and so on. I would strongly recommend that you never sign an organ donor card or an advanced directive even from a pro-life organization that authorizes taking your vital organs for transplantation. I was asking my wife, I wonder what happens to those people who, who are still alive. Like this young lady that was in, co in a coma and was aware of what was going on. Now, she may have had some brain activity. I don't know how far advanced the science was at that moment in time to determine whether she had brain activity or not. It was back in the 1970s. But in that particular situation, uh, she was aware of what was going on, but could not respond, couldn't open her eyes. Can you imagine someone being placed on a gurney and then placed into some type of room where their body is opened up and their organs are harvested, the, the incredible pain? I had a man in our church who received a heart transplant, okay? At that time, I was uneducated in this whole thing, and I understand his desire to live and desire to move on and go on. He was in his early, or actually late 50s at the time. And he shared with me this. He said, Stephen, while I was laying there and the procedure, the anesthesiologist didn't give me enough medication to put me completely under. And I remember the intensity of the pain as they opened up my chest cavity to do the work. And he passed out ultimately as a result of the incredible pain and he shared it with the doctors afterwards and said, no, you were asleep the whole time. And he began to recount to them their conversations that they were having during the time that he was lucid and the pain was so intense. And they realized they had not done their job, particularly the anesthesiologist, had not done their job. Can you imagine someone who's been, quote, declared brain dead, 
because his body is broken, maybe an accident, it could be a fall, it could be, it could be a heart attack, it could be a number of things. He's dead. She's dead. There's people all over that could benefit from their healthy organs. Why don't you take those organs out? Why don't you donate? I, I put down on my Texas driver's license, yes, I, I'm willing to be an organ donor because I had no idea. I didn't understand that organs are taken from people who are still living because they can't be taken from people who are dead. Those organs lose their vitality. And then now as I've discovered that there's money to be made, folks, please hear me out. I love you guys. And I'm sharing this with you from a pastor's heart. Fetal tissue from aborted babies is being used to make a lot of money for a lot of people. And there's a lot of research going on today. There was a man who actually videotaped uh, Planned Parenthood uh, leaders in a particular area talking about what they do with the bodies and how they sell them to this, this research lab or that research lab or another research lab. You see, it becomes, it becomes, when, when death becomes a source of income for somebody, there's a huge push to continue moving it along. Moving it along. <laughs> I had this little cartoon as I was teaching this course at Continental Theological Seminary, the course on ethics, biblical ethics, of this old man on a cloud playing his harp. And he sees a, a, a little one on another cloud playing his harp. And he talks, he talks about what brought him there. Yeah, I had a heart attack, and here I am. What brings you here to the little one? Oh, I was in my mother's womb, and she took my life. <clears throat> There's a lot of wickedness in this world, and please hear me out. There are people out there that don't give a rip about humanity or human life. They're, they're, all they're concerned about is the bottom line and how much money they're going to make. And so they're pushing these things heavy, hard. We talked about, several weeks ago, we talked about the Georgia Guidestones that are in Elberton, Georgia. Real, live, I'm not talking about some conspiracy theory, stones that, that were erected in, right now it's been 40 years, 1980. And the first dictate on that those stones is simply this, our goal is that the world population, or in order to bring balance to the world, that the world's population should be 500 million people. Well, what do you do with the 7.5 billion people that are alive today? Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give life, and life more abundantly. Life more abundantly abundantly. I don't want any of you to feel condemned at all. Maybe you have a loved one that their body parts were shared because you acted in ignorance and God's grace covers all of that. But once we have the knowledge of what happens and if we give our authorization without giving God the opportunity to bring healing and health and restoration, we're actually signing on to the death of that individual. You know, even if they're paraplegic or quadriplegic from an accident, their life still has value. As Sister Peggy mentioned tonight, Johnny Erickson taught her. Dove into a shallow lake and broke her neck, and from her neck down, completely paralyzed. In our world today, the parents would have said, really, I think you should consider taking her off of life-sustaining sustenances because the quality of her life is going to be diminished. The value that she can bring to society is diminished. And we see what God has done with Johnny Erickson Tata to have an impact across the globe. She's now in her 60s, and we see how God has used her. 
So death occurs when all three vital systems in the body are no longer functioning or, or they're, they are so damaged that there is no hope of restoration. And at that point in time, they're shutting down and ultimately the time of death will come. That leads me to the next, what are the dangers? When a person finds themselves or finds their loved one in a situation where they're unable, incompetent to respond. It could be an elderly grandparent or parent. It could be a child or a grandchild or, or someone that is immediate relation, a husband or a wife that has been in an accident and their bodies are broken. There's the pressure that comes today in the hospitals that you should sign a living will. And I'm sure they have the, 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 the uh, what do we call them, the no notary? The notary, uh, is that what we call them, notaries? Notaries, notaries there to sign off on, on, on the living will or the advanced directives. You see, uh, first of all, let me explain to you, a living will or an advanced directive, what is it? They instruct medical personnel to stop medical treatment when the patient is in a terminal condition terminal according to the doctor or doctors. They can also appoint a third party to give this type of instruction for the patient. On the surface, this looks good. It is only to be enacted when a patient is considered incompetent and unable to make his or her own medical treatment decisions. The problem, however, is that a living will or an advanced directive, the laws go well beyond what were before, before their enacted legal, ethical, and moral norms that go far beyond what has been considered normal. You see, in the beginning, advanced directives were directed at stopping the use of extraordinary medical technology to keep dying people alive. In other words, if you took them off the respirator, they would die because the respiratory system was shot. There was no way that individual and they've been on respirators for a long time. We, we had a friend, Cynthia and I, the, the Myricks. His wife <coughs> had uh, issues dealing with cancer, and she was on a ventilator. And with the family there, and she still being cognizant, said, remove the ventilator. If God chooses that I live, then I live. If God chooses to take me, I'm ready to go. It wasn't a desire to take off the ventilator so that she would die. It was, okay, let God be the determining factor. 20 minutes, she passed into eternity. And she went to be with the Lord. Joel and his wife and other family members. His wife was actually a Myrick. And, and I remember the pain and the, and, and, the, and, and, and the hurt that they went through through that process and how hard it was for them. But at the same time, what they were doing is they were taking away, or she authorized the taking away of extraordinary measures to keep her alive. They have a, a, a phrase in French called a charmant therapeutique. Uh, that is what we're calling here extraordinary methods to keep one alive to the point that they're hooked up to everything you can imagine and they have medicine pumping into their bodies and everything because the family doesn't want to let go of someone without these things that would die. I'm talking about uh, issues with heart, heart machines that are palpitating, keeping the circulatory system, the respiratory system going and all that. And without those things, their body would just naturally die. Today, however, in the past, it was to take away or to say, I don't want extraordinary measures or medical treatment to keep me alive. Today, however, advanced directives and living wills are being used to deny people not just basic medical treatment, but also food and water. Food and water. How did this come about? Over the years, there has been a gradual redefining of key terms in advanced directives. For example, many state laws and court decisions now consider the words 
medical treatment to include the provision of basic care such as food and water. In other words, to remove all medical care is to totally take everything and disconnect everything that would provide and guarantee life. Now, obviously, if someone is in a a state of coma, they are not going to be able to feed themselves at that moment in time. So they are nourished either through intravenously or through a tube being placed in their stomach or what, however that food and hydration, that water gets into their system so that they can continue to live until, until a recovery is imminent or death comes. However, in most advanced directives and living wills that you might sign in a hospital, what you see there is this thing that says this individual doesn't want any medical treatment so we cut them off from everything we cut them off from everything terminal includes people who are far from imminent death and indeed not even dying now we'll get into a further definition of that in a little bit but In essence, an advanced directive or living will authorizes a doctor to stop basic care, such as the provision of food and water, when a person is not near death. This amounts to authorizing euthanasia by starvation and dehydration. As we talked last week, it's a horrible thing. It is a horrible thing. One thing we must remember is that the living wills, that living wills and advanced directives were the brainchild of the Euthanasia Society of America and Euthanasia Education Council of, of 1967. That's when they became something that they began to push in a, in, a, in a great way. Why? What is the ultimate purpose for enacting laws that permit the deliberate dehydration and starvation of parent, patients? The response? To gain social and legal acceptance of all forms of euthanasia and assisted suicide. To see your loved one die of hydration, dehydration, and starving. Oh, I can't imagine what that does to one's heart. And so it becomes, in your mind, something more acceptable to give them a shot of a lethal poison that takes their life in a matter of moments so that they don't have to suffer like that. They say if we can get people to accept the removal of all treatment and care, especially the removal of food and fluids, they will see what a painful way this is to die, and then, in the patient's best interest, they will accept the lethal injection. They say if people get to this point, then they will promote euthanasia. What are some of the legal definitions? Life-prolonging procedure means any medical procedure, treatment, or intervention which utilizes mechanical or other artificial means to sustain, restore, or supplant a spontaneous vital function or is otherwise of such a nature as to afford a patient no reasonable expectation of recovery from a terminal condition. Number two, under this, what is a life-prolonging procedure It's when applied to a patient in a terminal condition would only serve to prolong the dying process. The term includes artificially administered hydration and nutrition. The term shall also include cardiopulmonary resuscitation. There is a point when the body refuses to even receive food and hydration. The body, as it were, is shutting down. And to try to keep that person alive through artificial means is really, in a way, cruel. I'm not talking about taking, I'm talking about people that are on the cusp of death. I'm not talking about people, I'm talking they're using extraordinary means to keep that person alive. Question, do you understand what this means, what I just read? The average person does not. People are not given a copy of the legal, the law and legal definitions to read when offered an advanced directive to sign. Instead, they are often given a very simplified 
a mis- misleading explanation like this. Hear me out. This directive simply says that if you are near death, you don't want artificial means like tubes and machines that will only prolong your dying. Now the question has to be asked, what if I am not dying and I still have months ahead of me? By signing an advance directive, a person may unwittingly be giving permission to hasten cause his or her death or or he or she may be refusing very ordinary things upon which his or her life depends insulin no medication blood pressure medications antibiotics food and water i shared with you a story last week about a woman that was taken off of a respirator and she survived but she was still in a coma and for nine years she continued in this comatose state until She caught pneumonia, and the doctors, with the permission of her family, did not treat her pneumonia. And thus, her body died as a result of the disease. What does life prolonging mean? Prolonging our lives is what we all do by eating and drinking and taking our prescribed medications. Euthanasia and those who promote it have created a system of living wills and advanced directives that are obscure and difficult to fully understand. And thus, when we sign off on them, we place ourselves at danger and at risk. A terminal terminal condition means a condition caused by injury, disease, or illness from which, to a reasonable degree of medical probability, a patient cannot recover. And, one, the patient's death is imminent, or the patient is in a persistent vegetative state. Now, hear it out. Persistent vegetative state is not, it's not in itself a terminal condition. And to define it as such is to lie. Persistent vegetative state. The individual's body is still functioning. The brain is still functioning because the respiratory system and the cardio system is continuing to function. Terminal condition. Death, another thing, another phrase is death is imminent means that the patient's life expectancy must be one year or less. One year or less. What is a reasonable degree of medical probability a patient cannot recover? That's the question. What is? What is the definition and who decides? There are numerous cases of recoveries after doctors told family, families that there was no hope. Now, to bring this down, there was this aunt to this particular single missionary woman who was in the last days of her life according to the doctor she was going to die at any moment and because she was overseas and she had come home she wanted to go through all the legal processes of dispersing her belongings selling her home and and doing all that and giving the money to wherever she had designated it to be given it was an unmarried aunt well she had done all this And then within one week's time, she made a 100% recovery in one week's time. The doctor said she's going to die. And she made a 100% recovery. Unfortunately for the missionary, uh, there was a lot of litigation that she had to go through and even the potential of having to spend time in jail for selling her aunt's belongings when her aunt was not dead. You see, these types of things are definitely, the doctor is not God. A doctor does not know all that God has in store or planned. Important distinctions between the living will and the durable power of attorney uh, attorney for health care. That's what they call the DPHC. The durable power of attorney for health care. A living will, it gives authority to my attending physicians. Someone who may be a stranger and may interpret your directives in ways you do not intend to withhold or withdraw life-prolonging procedures from you, like food and water, medications, and other things. Informed consent is not possible. You cannot make informed medical decisions based on guesswork about the future. You don't know what you're going to face. You don't know what you're going to encounter. How can you make a a living will that, that will cover all the bases, or at least cover the basics? It may tie the hand of a physician whose skills might restore you to health and or save your life. 
We can't do anything. Technology has come, and we're able to bring healing, but because of this, and the way that it's interpreted, the hands are tied and the doctors can do nothing. With the durable power of attorney for health care, you name an agent, someone you know and trust, to make medical decisions for you if you are determined to be incapable of making an informed decision without, about providing, withholding, or withdrawing medical treatment. Your agent can make informed decisions based on your current condition, treatment options, etc. This is perhaps the better of the two because hopefully the person that is the one representing you that has the power of attorney in those types of situations loves you and knows what your heart is, but it's not always a guarantee. It is not always a guarantee. So we have these definitions here as we talked about the living will and the advanced directives. Folks, uh, there's a better way. What can we do to protect ourselves from doctors or individuals that don't have our best interest in mind? And I'll close with this. As a person who fully respects human life, you'll want to ensure that your actual wishes are understood and carried out. Therefore, you will need a truly pro-life advanced directive. This advanced directive is called a loving will. It's not a will in this idea of distributing your goods after you're dead. It's a living will, like, like, or it's, it's a living will or an advanced directive that covers the necessities and the basics. The loving will is a document that tells your doctor and other healthcare person, uh, personnel how to take care of you should you become so sick that you are unable to communicate your wishes. In short, it instructs healthcare per personnel to do nothing intentionally or by act or omission to cause your death. It lets them know why a living, why a loving will, excuse me, there are two reasons. The practice of withholding treatment and care, even food and water, is becoming more and more common in medicine today. The basic elements. In 1991, federal law increased the chances that you may feel pressure to sign something like a living will that will not protect your life because it is, is subject to interpretation. What's more, according to recent reports, some medical personnel assume that by signing a living will, the patient automatically indicates he or she does not want to be given even minimal care in certain circumstances. What does the living will accomplish? It is important to understand that the loving will, excuse me, what does the loving will accomplish? It is important to understand that the loving will provides only basic guidelines for your care and treatment. It can't cover every issue or every circumstance or every situation that one would face. The loving will does not use terms like ordinary or extraordinary because these words are now even more than ever subject to interpretation that distorts their proper traditional meanings. So those words aren't used. They use the actual words of what type of treatment that you want to receive. A loving will specifically states that it is to be interpreted in favor of continued life. In other words, any ambiguity is to be resolved in favor of continuing our lives. A loving will helps protect us if we become sick or hurt and cannot communicate with the doctor. It would tell our doctor or our nurse that we want to receive water and food, be kept clean and comfortable, treat our illness or injuries, and keep us as pain-free as possible. Pain-free as possible. So where do you go to get a living will or a loving will like this? You can go to the all.org website and they have a whole document with the actual text that you need called the loving will. And here it has the whole thing where you fill it out and it explains to whomever your doctor is and your, the person that has durable uh, power of attorney for decisions to be made, it explains clearly what type of treatments or what type of things that you're wanting as far as life-sustaining. Those types of things would not be removed from you. And also has a durable power of attorney where you would choose someone, fill it out, and these documents would be notarized so that they would become legal. And at that point in time, a copy would be given to your doctor, your caretaker, 
so that they have it in your file in the event anything should happen. And then also the durable power of attorney would be given to the loved one or loved ones that you give that power to so that they have a copy of it and they also would have a copy of the loving will, the loving will so that you would be able to make it. This right here, the only thing you pay is the, the notary fee, and that's it. I have a copy of this, not just a physical copy, but I have the PDF copy where we can print out one if you're interested. And I'm not selling anything here, folks. There's nothing here. You're not charged for this. I give it to you, then you make the choice to see if this is going to work for you. Why, why am I doing this? Folks, we live in a world that's corrupted by sin, where human life no longer has much value to a lot of people. And we've seen evidence across our society. We've seen evidence across our world over the last 120 years where life has not, does not have value for those who do not believe in God and do not believe in the sanctity of life. Unfortunately, as I shared with you last week, there are many doctors today, most doctors do not take the Hippocratic Oath meaning doing everything they can within their power to preserve life and not giving anything that would take life. 2,400 years before Christ, the Hippocratic Oath came into existence. The father of medicine, modern medicine as they would call her medicine, Hippoc uh, Hippocrates. In this particular situation, we are facing individuals that are looking at the bottom line, insurance companies that are looking at the bottom line. Maybe the question you need to ask from your insurance provider, are they willing to provide for basic care, minimal care? It doesn't mean you'll be in the hospital the whole time. I mean, we look at Terry, oh, how do you say her last name? Shivo. She was living at home in a semi-comatose state, cognizant, probably much like this young lady I told you about. And yet her husband, motivated by resources, finances, and wanting to move on with his life, had a judge dictate that her feeding tube and hydration tube be taken out, even after the family said, listen, we'll take her. Why did the father or the husband fight it so much? Because he still had $700,000 or whatever was left over of that that was given to him in the settlement to take care of her and whatever was left of that was his it was a matter of money a matter of relationship a matter of other things and that woman was put to death there was a great legal battle and in the end she lost her life the Bible says that in the end times Men will be lovers of themselves. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of my return. Matthew chapter 24. And euthanasia is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very real thing today. As I've shared with you, we talk, oh, I should have the right to die and to choose my moment of death. Yes, today you may have the right to die. But tomorrow, your children, it might be their duty to die when their lives are no longer considered of quality or value to the society. And that's what happened in Germany back in the 1930s and 40s. It's happened in other places, and unfortunately, it's happening even in our own country. It is important that we educate ourselves and others about the increasing threat of euthanasia. We need to strongly oppose its legalization, and we need to pray that God gives us wisdom and compassion to take care of those who are suffering in a way that brings comfort and dissuades those who are suicidal from taking their own lives. May God help us. I'd like to close with a word of prayer. And again, if you're interested, contact me, let me know. You can call the office, talk to Kimberly, and I can get that to you either through an email or uh, an attachment, or I can, we can make a copy for you and get it to you. I think it's something important to seriously consider. There's a whole packet here that explains it. It's all here. Uh, it's worth the read uh, so that you can protect yourself or your loved ones from individuals who would seek to profit from your loved one's death. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and I praise you that you are the giver of life.
you created us in your image. And your love for us was so great. Yes, you could have wiped us all out, and we know that the people in the days of Noah were so wicked and so turned away from you. They were so given over to the lust for their own things, the lust of this life, that they totally refused and rejected you and only Noah's family lived. Father, your word says you wouldn't destroy the world in the same way. God, you sent your son Jesus so that we could have life and life more abundantly. Satan fights against your purposes and your plans because he hates you and he hates your creation. He hates humanity. He tries to help them or make them believe that he loves them, but he doesn't. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy even those who are serving him in this world. And it is my prayer, Father God, that you would help us as the body of Christ to value the sanctity of human life and to do all that we can to help encourage and to promote life in a world that is increasingly encouraging and profiting from the death of those in the womb all the way to the end of life. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and move in a very real and powerful way in our lives. We need you. We need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your wisdom. Father, this message is not intended to bring guilt to anyone who has received a transplant or any of that. That's not the purpose of this message. But Father God, it's just to point out the importance of the human life and doing everything that can possibly be done to preserve that human life. And God, we think of those who are loved ones who find themselves in these comatose states and they haven't made peace with you. God, we need your grace and we need your mercy. Help us to have wisdom. Help us to make the right choices where we can and to encourage others also. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Folks, I want to encourage you. Look to the Lord. I know this subject is heavy. It's not easy, but it's a reality in which we live today. And these are the ethical issues that we're dealing with. And it's very easy to listen to the news media and to listen to the documentaries and this, that, or the other that are pro-euthanasia. And they, they, they try to make it very merciful and, and all that. But again, what is merciful today, tomorrow, is imposed death on those who they consider aren't viable citizens or persons even re redefining what personhood is. We need wisdom. May God give us grace this week. May we experience the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives. And may we see him work and move in us as he would desire, desire to work and move in us. We love you folks. And uh, for the, you ladies, we'll see you on Wednesday morning. I should say Sister Cindy and Sister Kimberly will see you on Wednesday morning for the women's prayer group. And then Wednesday night for the Bible study and Royal Rangers and, and Impact Girls. And then uh, again on Sunday, uh, just moving forward. Listen, just one last thing. If, uh, if you're available or you have time, uh, on Thursday we're going to be getting a dumpster to take out all the drywall that has been taken out or taken off the walls uh, at the Humboldt property. And we're going to be putting it in. Uh, the dumpster. Any extra hands would be a wonderful blessing to us so that we can get the whole interior cleaned up and prepared for the insulation and sheetrock. And so uh, we, we appreciate all that you're, you're doing and helping us with. We love you guys. May the Lord bless you and we'll be uh, seeing you soon.